All right, so we're moving on to chapter six. 6.1 deals with exponential growth and decay. So for exponential growth and decay functions, an exponential function has the form y is equal to a times b raised to the power of x. So that x is in our exponent. That's what makes it an exponential function. We have exponential growth when b is greater than 1. And then we have exponential decay when it's less than 1. But that'll be on the next slide. So this page is our exponential growth functions. So b is greater than 1. And our parent function looks like this. So all of your exponential functions, the graphs of exponential functions, will have this shape. And exponential growth rises from left to right. So it gets bigger as it gets exponentially bigger as x's get bigger. So as the x value increases, the y value increases big time. And then we also have an asymptote here. So for our parent function, the asymptote would be at zero. So our graph gets really, really close to our asymptote, but never touches. And then again, our favorite domain and range, the domain of our graph is all real numbers. So we could plug in whatever number we wanted for X, but for Y, it is greater than zero. So it's always gonna be whatever your asymptote is because you get really, really close to the asymptote, but don't touch it and you don't cross it. So our range is Y is greater than zero. Whatever our asymptote is, Y has to be above that. And then here is our exponential decay function. So when b is in between 0 and 1, so it's going to be some type of decimal that's less than 1 or a fraction, anything in between 0 and 1 gives us exponential decay. So decay, going from left to right, our graph is decreasing. And then again, we have our asymptote that's at zero for our parent function. And our domain is still all real numbers, same thing as exponential growth, and our range is greater than zero. So same domain and range as before. The only difference is this one falls as the x values get bigger. The other one got went up as the x values got bigger. So here again, we have exponential decay when that b, so whatever is being raised to the exponent, is in between 0 and 1. So for example 1, we have to tell whether each function represents exponential growth or exponential decay. So it's exponential because that x is in the exponent. And then if we have a number greater than 1, we have exponential growth. So here we have 2, so this would give us growth. And our graph would look like this because we're growing as the x values get bigger. So if this was on a graph, our graph would look like that. And then for b, we have y is equal to 1 half to the power of x. Since this is a fraction, it's in between 0 and 1. This gives us exponential decay. And our graph would be decreasing as x values get bigger. So it would look like that. All right, we have four more examples here. We're going to graph all of them, but just a rough graph. We don't have to plug in numbers or anything, just showing you what the graph of exponential growth and exponential decay look like. So for number one, we have four. Four is bigger than one, so we have exponential growth. So this goes up. Number two. We have a fraction that's less than 1, so this is exponential decay. So it starts up and goes down. For number 3, we have 0 0.25 less than 1, so this is decaying. So it starts high and goes low. And then 
For number four, we have 1.5, so this is greater than one. So we have exponential growth. So it starts low and goes up high. So exponential growth and decay can often be used in real life examples. I actually taught this in Algebra 2 last year in like March and April. So coronavirus graph was like a big example of exponential growth because as time went on, the numbers got bigger and bigger. So our graph of coronavirus looks like that. Big example of exponential growth. Here we have our exponential growth model, so we could always relate exponential growth to one of these formulas. A is going to be our initial amount, so whatever we start with. R is our rate, so that's going to be our percent, but in decimal form, so it's always going to be a decimal. And then if it's increasing, we use this. If it's decreasing, we use this one. And then the quantity 1 plus R is our growth factor. So if it, again, if it's increasing, we're growing. If it's decreasing, it's the decay factor. A little side note that I'm going to add here, just like your SAT tip of the day, because percentages come up like this in the SAT often. Whenever you have like the percent of something, so if I was taking like 40% of 100, I would multiply. So you just multiply. Let's. I'm going to use 40% as an example. So if we had 40% of something, we would multiply whatever that something is, let's just say y, times 0.4. So this is if we had 40% of y. If our problem said that we had 40% more of something or we're increasing by 40%, so 40% more or increasing or any word similar to those, would be, you multiply that number, we're saying y, times 1 plus 0.4. So whenever it says 40% more of something, you add 1 to your decimal. And then if we had 40% less, or we were decreasing by 40%, we would multiply that number times 1 minus whatever your decimal is. So this is just a little SAT tip of the day kind of to understand what to do with percentages because you don't always multiply times your percentage. Sometimes you have to add one to it or subtract it from one if you are taking, depending on what the wording says. So if you are in a store and you get 40% off, so like less is the same thing as 40% off, we would multiply whatever it is. Let's say we got a shirt for $100 and we're we had 40% off of it. So we would multiply it by 1 minus 0.4. So this would actually be 100 times 0.6. And we would be paying $60 for that shirt. So you don't always multiply it by whatever your percentage is. Sometimes you got to do a little math beforehand. So this kind of relates to what we're doing, but just also a helpful hint for later on in life, I guess. All right, so example two, solving a real life problem. The value of a car Y in thousands of dollars can be approximated by the model Y is equal to 25 times 0.85 to the power of T, where T is the number of years since the car was new. Tell whether the model represents exponential growth or exponential decay. So same thing we were doing in example one. If whatever's raised to that power is less than one, we have exponential decay. So here we have DK, which makes sense because as years go on, your car depreciates in value. Your value of your car gets less and less. Your car doesn't increase in value because it's being used. B says identify the annual percent increase or decrease in the value of the car. So we just said that our car is decreasing in value. So we would use that one minus whatever our percentage is, so let's say x, 
and that's giving us what this is, which is 0.85. So it's giving us that number in our problem, and it's decreasing value, so we use 1 minus x. Our goal is to find out what x is, so we're going to solve for x. We're solving for this percent. So we want to subtract 1 on both sides, so x is equal to 0.85 minus 1 would give us negative 0.15, and it's a negative x. So then we just divide both sides by negative 1 to get rid of that negative, so x is equal to 0.15. So sometimes you can just see what you are subtracting from this number, but sometimes it helps just to put it in the formula. That way you don't make any silly mistakes. Put it into this formula. We know that since we are decreasing, we're using that 1 minus x from the formula before, on the slide before. So that 1 minus x gives us 0.85. So our goal is to find out what the percent is, which is x. So x is actually our rate. We can turn this into a percent just by multiplying it by 100 or moving the decimal twice. So this is actually 15%. So our car is decreasing by 15%. And if whatever your number is here is less than 1, so if it's less than 1, you use the 1 minus x. If this was a number more than 1, you would use the 1 plus x. Alright, example 3. In 2000, the world population was about 6.09 billion. During the next 13 years, the world population increased by about 1.8% each year. Write an exponential growth model giving the population Y in billions T years after 2000. Estimate the world population in 2005. So we are plugging this into our formula. So y is equal to a times 1. We're using plus here because we're increasing. So 1 plus r to the power of t. So a is our initial amount, whatever we start with. r is our rate, and t is time. So our initial amount was 6.09 billion. And then 1 plus our rate. Our percentage is 1.18, but we have to change this to our rate, so we move the decimal twice. So this is 1 plus 0 0.0118. So to go from percent to rate, they are different. You always have to take your percent and move the decimal. Change it into a rate. Percent and rate is not the same thing. And then this is raised to t time we're looking at. We're estimating the world population in 2005. So that our time would be five years because we go from 2000 to 2005. Now we can just put this into our calculator to solve. So be careful with your order of operations. So we want to do the parentheses first. 1 plus 0.0118 would be 1.0118 to the fifth power. Next, once we did our parentheses, we have our exponent. So we would put this into our calculator. Now every calculator is different. If you use the phone calculator, it has that little X raised to the Y button. So you would put 1.0118, click that X raised to the Y button, and then 5. So for this section, you have to use your calculator, so make sure you know how to use it. So I would definitely practice in the notes to see if you're putting it in right, because 
That way you know if you're doing it right or not for the homework. And then after you click five, you have to click the equal button. That's in the phone calculator. Remember, every calculator is different. Some calculators are smarter than others, so just know how to use your calculator. So when I put 1.0118 to the fifth power, I got 1.0604. The more decimal places you keep, the more exact your answer is going to be. If you can, just keep it all in your calculator. Don't write it down, clear out, and then do the next step. Keep it all in your calculator if you can. So then we're multiplying this by 6.09. And that gives us 6.457. It doesn't tell us what to round to, but it's 7, 8, so I'll just say 0.58. So I'll round it up. And then this is billion. So... The world population in 2005 would be 6.458 billion people. So this is our answer. So from here down, you're just putting it into the calculator. And to get to this step, we just plugged in everything that was given to us. We had our initial amount, which was 6.09. We had our rate, which was our percent that we changed into a rate, and then our time was 5. Next, we have compounded interest. So our compounded interest is given to us in this formula, where P is our principal, so that's what we start with. R is our rate, expressed as a decimal, so just like before, it's our percentage turned into a decimal and compounded n times per year. So n is the amount of times after two years. So we have a is equal to p times one plus r over n to the power of n times t. And a is our amount. So in real life, compounded interest would be like if you had money in a bank account and you're earning interest on it and whatever you earn as your interest, it gets put back into the bank account so you earn more money off of the more money that you have in your account. So that's compounded interest. And the problem will tell you if it's compounded or not. So it'll be specific and that way if it says it's compounded, you know you'll use this formula. So example five, you deposit $9,000 in an account that pays 1.46 annual interest. Find the balance after three years when the interest is compounded quarterly. So our formula is A is equal to P times one plus R over N to the power of N times T. So we need to plug everything in. A is the amount so that's going to be our balance that's what we're trying to find p is our initial amount so we start with nine thousand dollars it pays 1.46 percent annual interest so we take our percent and we have to change it to our rate so we just move the decimal twice so this would be 0 0.0146 so one plus 0 0.0146 over n, which is how many times that it's compounded per year. We'll get to that in a second. We're looking at three years, so our t is three. So now we just have to plug in our n here and our n here. So it tells us that it's compounded quarterly. I would love to ask you in real life what you think quarterly means but just think of quarter as like there's four quarters in a dollar so there's four quarters in a year so quarterly is four so we're multiplying the three times four and the four goes in our denominator here so some words that you'll see in these compounded interest questions would be quarterly which means four times per year semi-annually semi-annually which means twice per year, annually, which is one time per year, daily, 
would be 365, because there's 365 days in a year. Monthly, would be 12 times per year. So those are pretty much the only ones you'll see. I'll let you guys know if there's another one that comes up, but it should be like pretty self-explanatory. Just think about how many times does that occur in the year? The hardest one's probably quarterly. But let's solve our problem now. So simplify as much as we can. Remember to follow the order of operations. So first we wanna do our parentheses. So we have to figure out what this is in our parentheses. So we divide 0 0.0146 by four and add it to one. So we get 1.00365. And then three times four would be 12. So now we have to put 1.00365 to the 12th power in our calculator. So again, if you're using the phone calculator, you use that X raised to the Y button. So this would be 1.00365. Click that X raised to the Y and then 12, and then equals, and that'll give you 1.0446. Remember, keep it in your calculator if you can, or write down as many decimal places as you can, because the more decimal places you keep with you, the more exact your answer is gonna be. So then we have to multiply the 9,000 So we get 9,402.21. So since we're dealing with money here, we would round it to two decimal places because you don't have like four decimal places when you're dealing with money. It's just whatever cents you have. So this is our answer. All right, so example seven deals with, I think it was example four. Or example two, example two that we were doing before. So we have to figure out what percent of the iodine decays each hour given this formula. It's saying that it decays, so it decreases. So we use our one minus x, which gave us 0.5. So this is equal to one minus x. So if we subtract one from both sides, we get negative x is equal to negative 0.5. Divide both sides by negative, x is equal to 0.5. So 0.5 is our rate. We just change this to a decimal, so you gotta move the decimal to, change it to a percent, so you move the decimal two times this way, so it would be 50%. Number eight deals with example five, so that was the one we did on the last slide. We're using the same formula that we had before, but now we're just changing our N because instead of being compounded quarterly, we're compounded daily. So what do you think daily means? Daily 365. So everything else from our problem stays the same except our N changes to 365. So we have our amount is equal to 9,000 times one plus Oh, the decimal, let's see, I don't remember. Zero, one, four, six. Yep, over 365. And this is times T, which is our time. So three times three, six, five. So let's solve it. And most everything here you just put into your calculator. Depending on how smart your calculator is, you'll have to write some things down, but make sure you know how to use your calculator. So, and make sure you follow your order of operations. First, we have the 0 0.0146 divided by 365 plus one. That gave us one. 0. 0.00, oh, um, there's four zeros and then four. And then we have to see what three times 365 is. So that is 1,095. So now we do our exponent, 
1.0004. Click that X raised to the Y button. And then 1095 equals 9,000 times 1.04477. Keep it in your calculator if you can. Times 9,000. So this is 9,402.95. Not much of a difference in answer than what we got in the last problem. I think it was 9,402.21 in the last one. So that's why it's important to keep all your decimal places because even the decimal part of your answer matters. So that's why this is important. These are important. Keep it in your calculator if you can so you get the most exact answer possible. All right, so that is it for the notes. I want you guys to turn in 6.1 notes. I'll give you until tomorrow morning to get it turned in. So this will be like your homework to turn in the notes. Make sure you watch the video, fill out the notes, turn them in, and um, work on the homework too. The homework will be due on Wednesday. So your homework for tonight is turn in the notes, the 6.1 work from the book will be due on Wednesday. So that way, if you have any questions about this, you can ask me in class on Tuesday, but don't wait until Tuesday night to start working on the homework. It'll be a little hefty. So work on what you can now, save your questions for tomorrow that you don't understand and we can go over a couple of them together.